The Intertalk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Now, looking back on your final year in office, well, do you feel you ever obstructed justice or were part of a conspiracy to cover up or obstruct justice? No, I don't. And I'm interested that you use the term obstruction of justice. You perhaps have not read the statute with regard to the obstruction of justice. Well, as it happens, I have. Oh, you have, you say. Well, then, <clears throat> you'll know it doesn't just require an act. It requires a specific corrupt motive. And in this case, I didn't have a corrupt motive. What I was doing was in the interest of political containment. This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. If you see any other play this season on Broadway, it's got to be Frost Nixon, a play which accomplishes the astonishing thing of making someone like me sympathize with Richard Nixon. We're very pleased to have a playwright here with us and to introduce him, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. It is an amazing thing that an old Nixon hater like Susan actually feels something for Richard Nixon. And part of the reason is because this is a beautifully written, beautifully crafted play on Broadway by Peter Morgan, who joins us tonight on Theatre Talk. Welcome to Theatre Talk, Peter. Thank you. Uh, pretty good year for you. You wrote The Queen, which I believe won an Academy Award for um, uh, Helen Mirren. And another fine film, The Last King of Scotland, which I think won the Academy Award for Forrest Whitaker. So, Where was your Academy Award in all this, though? This is what I don't understand. I was criminally neglected. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. How dare that. Yeah. <laughs> Precisely. Well, we're going to uh, write, write things here on Broadway with uh, a lot of prizes we'll throw you away for Frost Nixon. Magnificent play about the uh, post-Watergate interviews that David Frost conducted with Richard Nixon. How did you come up with the idea for this play? I know, it's strange. The, uh, I saw some interviews that they'd done with David Frost, sort of like a television biography, and... Uh, it was three one-hour programs. In the middle of the second program, um, they got to talking about this, and they only gave it five minutes, but I was sort of riveted by it. And uh, I, I had no memory of it. I was 14, and mm. so I didn't watch it as it went out. Um, but even from his description of it, I got a sense that uh, it, 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 it wasn't... He wasn't covered in glory. He, you'd, you'd got the sense that it had been a problem. Mm. It, it, it had been a real struggle. And uh, I'd always thought, oh, that would be a terrific thing to write as a play, but having not written a play, I kept putting it off because, I, 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 quite honestly, I just wasn't confident enough to take it on. I just thought, you know, I, I, I wouldn't know where to start. And, um, and we should say Frost Nixon is your first play, right? You've done is. screenplays and teleplays, but this is the first yes, play. Yes, it is. I mean, I wrote a play with, together with one other person at university, but this is, you know, that was really something very different. And uh, this was my first grown-up endeavour. And... Um, so when I, when I finally came to doing it, I thought, well, it doesn't really matter if I fail. No one's commissioned me to write this. No one's yeah. paying me. So I, I went out and I interviewed a lot of people. And, and, and the moment that I knew there was a story in there was, you know, when I started, when, when I spoke to people who had been on Frost's side and people who had been on Nixon's side, and, and you'd realise there were many different points of view as to how these things went. And in particular, when I spoke to a couple of people on the Frost side and, and heard what chaos it was and, and, and that Frost had, you know, had very nearly lost everything. And uh, as soon as I heard that he'd paid Nixon $600,000, which don't forget in... You know, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, I reckon, we try to work it out. We think it's about $5 million now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the idea of paying a disgraced president $5 million uh, for an interview, you know, so... Obviously, Frost was hated by the you know, news, news establishment, the journalistic yeah. community here. And the more I found out about it, the more of a sort of cauldron of conflict it was. And I thought, you know, it was, it, I, I, you could at least just try writing about it and see what happens. What's so interesting is the, the time the lives of both of these men. And the way you've set it up, Nixon is disgraced. And he's plotting the, what will become the famous comeback. But what I didn't know was that... David Frost was in disgrace too, mm. yeah, I didn't know that because either. he'd had the failed television show in America, and he's now and he's become sort of a lightweight 
uh, TV host in England doing kind of entertainment sort of shows. And he, too, is trying to come out of his own wilderness back into well, higher journalistic uh, it's, it's unfair. I mean, I should, you know, I'm imagining David Frost on one side and his lawyer on the other side, <laughs> there, <laughs> as I reply here, because it's not fair to say that he was, you know, he, he, that his career was over. It is fair to say that his career, career was over in the United States. And in a line that he actually says in the play, you know, uh, success in America is unlike success anywhere else. It, although he was a household name in Australia and doing a successful talk show in Australia and simultaneously doing a talk show in the United Kingdom and flying on Concord between the two the whole yeah. time. So clearly a highly successful yeah. you know, but man. But licking his wounds from having lost the gig in America. Having, yeah. and, and, you know, being a, uh, having a big success in New York yes. and, and being yes. the toast of the town. Yes. You know, when you're in London and Sydney, you know, nicer that is. The, but here he disappeared. Here he disappeared, yeah. and that and that really niggled away at him because he'd been a success in England for a while. So, to to actually have been a failure somewhere, Frost doesn't comprehend failure, mm. and uh, and I think he was desperate to come back. So uh, to put it in that context, I, yes. Even though I certainly was around for his successful years, I was not aware of the huge egomania which you portray in this play that he was no. bringing to the table. <laughs> Yeah, the lawyer's calling again. <laughs> Peter. Her words, I didn't say. My words. <laughs> uh, the, the, what, what a big, what a big personality he was, mm. and, and, and in his own way that he, you, the, I love. That, for instance, you, uh, his producer's a big character, and of course, mm -hmm. I love that you have this producer wrangling this ego and trying to get this this thing done. That that he, this wasn't exactly just a, a, a tame personality coming to the Nixon interviews. No, and. It's because of his contrast with Nixon, you know, uh, that I was so drawn to this material because Frost is this, I mean, even if you just, I mean, when he, sometimes my phone rings, you know, I'm, I, I'm working at home, the phone rings and it goes, good morrow, sweet prince. <laughs> and he's just this surreally ebullient and confident human being who, uh, you know, is quite different from the, you know, from the, from the, from the closed off, suspicious, you know, wounded Nixon, who finds life so difficult. And and so the contrast between these two men, and yet also some similarities too. And, and I think the moment where the play really kicks in is, is sort of about two thirds of the way through where the play stops dwelling on their differences and starts actually focusing on some of their similarities and, 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 and develops a relationship between the two of them. You know, that that's what, that's what I could see from the get-go was what, what was a big similarity that you saw in them when you were researching the play ambition sort of mm. boundaryless ambition yeah. Yeah. and and uh, and a need and a both craving the limelight and uh, you got to ask yourself I mean um, you know just for Frost to be endlessly on television, for Nixon to be endlessly in the, you know. And, and no matter how far down they are, you can't count them out. You can't count, they, they wanna, won't let you count them out. They are both, uh, you know, forces of nature. And there's know? a certain incredible shamelessness in both of them. Yes. I mean, you know, that, that, that Nixon, for all that had happened, the, myopically all he saw was now how am I going to climb back up and get in the public eye. Yes. I mean, I get that from your play and from what I observed as... Of the of the actual man. Well, he wouldn't. He didn't like retirement as an idea. Yeah. But you know? and he didn't understand. But well, this of course is the. I don't want to give. I don't want to give away the play. But he didn't understand the magnitude of what he'd done to be disgraced. In yes, a certain I, sense. I, 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 I'm not sure if that's true. I, 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 you know, maybe it is. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell. But if he had really understood what he had done, the criminality of what he had done, you just think he would have. Crawled away. Well, now, you, you know, could throw that same question at Tony Blair, couldn't you? Now, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, yes. not that quite. Why no. do you yeah. think he? Why? Because Tony Blair she's an didn't. Old Nixon stop, hater no, because way Tony back. Blair didn't help cover up a criminal break-in. He didn't conspire to criminally um, uh, jigger the election. Okay, okay, yeah. just to just to take just to. If you if you remove the crimes, I mean, what you were talking about there was an inability to connect with uh, your own culpability. And Blair, it seems to me, has has steadfastly refused to sort of connect. But I think the crimes are awfully important. And remember Nixon in his early what, career. An illegal war. The crime of an illegal war. I mean, trumped up intelligence. I mean, at least yes. the one thing. I mean, the one thing you can't <laughs> take. I mean, what you, one thing you can't. You can lay delaying getting out of Vietnam at Nixon's door, but you can't delay going into Vietnam no, on no, Nixon's no, door. You, you can lay that at the door of Tony Blair. You can lay that at the door of Tony Blair on completely cooked up evidence. Mm. But
But in other words, the only way he could take anybody with him was with this absolute cast iron, you know, they can get... Uh, you know the, for, the 45 minute threat with the with the with the missile strikes and so forth. I mean these things didn't exist. All right, but He's because Tony up. Blair did this 40 years on, we, we, that doesn't take away from what Nixon was doing. Uh, at of the course time. not. And of the course thing not. is that Nixon began his career in the early 50s. He ran an illegal election for his first Congress seat. I mean he was. That's why they called him Tricky Dick because he was always yes. And uh, doing so much this. of his own advancing was he, done at the expense of other people's well, Welcome to politics, though. Right. I mean this is not. Well, unique to Nixon no, but, but, advancing at the expense but, of other people in politics. No, that's true. That is true. I, 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 but, but, but his crimes were more unambiguously villainous in that yeah. sense. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, and... and uh, uh, but but my point was actually not to... I didn't want to compare the weight of the crimes. Mm -hmm. I was actually... What I wanted to compare was a politician's inability to, con to, to yes. somehow self... Co to connect yes. with, with blame. Yeah. And Blair has been completely... Whether it's through just, you know, my myopic denial of the charges or, or through personal conviction, he has just refused to in any way acknowledge his own culpability. It's interesting about Blair, though, because the movie The Queen is Blair uh, at his finest. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, I when know, Blair... I've got to you have to... You, <laughs> your fault. I was just going to ask you, how do you feel about glorifying... No, I, no, 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 I absolutely don't. I, don't tell. I, 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 I like to think of it as unfinished business. Because, um, yeah, well, because I, th you know, clearly the apotheosis of Tony Blair was not what I sort of set out to yeah. achieve in my sort of writing. Aha! Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, I, you know, so uh, the, th I'm, I'm hoping that we'll still do a third instalment, which tackles some of the. You oh, know, really? You want to continue your examination well, the, the, of Blair? The Queen was the second part, you know, the, of I, the deal. Of, right. Yeah, the deal was the first right. part, which, we, which is a much more. You know, that's quite a critical piece. Let but me just explain for viewers who haven't seen The Deal. The Deal, wonderful, wonderful um, um, uh, television uh, movie you did for with the With Stephen BBC. Frears as well. With St Yeah, with Stephen Frears directing. Uh, uh, and Michael Sheen. Michael Sheen. And The Deal is about the deal that Tony Blair struck with Gordon Brown. Correct. When they were beginning their political ascent. Mm. And that's sort of chapter one of your, what I guess will be a trilogy of, the, of yeah. Blair's life. Yeah. Chapter two is Blair... And with the queen. the queen at the time of Princess Diana's death, what then will Chapter Three be? It will well, be I, the Iraq I can't war. describe it. No, I, 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 I wouldn't do Iraq in that sense. I, I would love to do a story about Britain's relationship with the U.S. Mm. and therefore Blair in America. So I, I would, uh, and I haven't begun researching yet, so I couldn't tell you exactly which period because I would like to condense it and rather than you know, these dramas become unbelievably. And then, and then, and yeah. then. It's better to take a period that sort of encapsulates the whole thing. That's why sort of the Diana, you know, the five days after Diana's death is a really interesting way for me of looking at the Queen and Blair. But it's, it's, it's in a very restricted time frame. I, I would hope to find something similar and, and, and tell a story about, you know, Blair's relationship with America, England's relationship with America. Would you then stick to... Um, I don't want to call it a scheme, but the structure that you've been using of having these two titanic characters well, up against except, each other? Except what interests me about Blair is, uh, and America is his elasticity. How could mm. anybody stretch between Clinton and Bush? Mm. You know, how could anybody now, what, you know, and, and so actually that handover period, mm. and I, I, to be honest with you, I'd like to deal with both presidents if I possibly get a chance. Mm. I mean, I don't want to deal with both, but, you know, deal with Blair's response to it. I mean, very, for, 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 for a Brit to come to the States, uh, in the same way as I use Blair to go into the palace mm -hmm. and, and to use, you know, he would be our navigator in that right. sense, you know, because right. he goes into this, you know, absurd world, you know. Um, I would use him as our way into America. I think that, you know, to, to have him go on his first state tr visit as prime minister, I, something in that area. Interesting. I'd, I, yeah, I'd love to, I mean, I'd love to get stuck into it. Winds up with President Clinton, Hillary. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, now, that would be, that would be an interesting. We all um, laugh. Back to Frost Nixon, though. Um, Not if David Geffen has anything to do with it. <laughs> Precisely. Um, two terrific performances from Frank Langella as Nixon and Michael Sheen. And there's no defense to say that your plan failed. I mean, if I tried to rob a bank and failed, that's no defense. I still tried to rob that bank. Oh, will you just wait a minute there, Mr. Frost? There is no evidence well, of any the kind. Reason that there's I... no evidence is because 18 and a half minutes oh, of the conversation Jesus. with Bob Haldeman from this <coughs> June period have mysteriously been erased. That was an unfortunate oversight. Um, I remember talking to you a few months ago when you were in town. You didn't really 
know, have a sense of who Frank Langello was when he came in to audition for or read for the I part? didn't know that he was a theatre legend. I didn't know that, I didn't know his theatre pedigree. Yeah. I knew him as an actor, you know, a, a screen actor. Yeah. But uh, the impact that he had at that first reading was pretty, pretty great, wasn't it, when he did Nixon for you for the first time? No. No? No. <laughs> no, sorry. I've done my research. <laughs> um, no, 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 it wasn't because actually Frank didn't, Frank took a long time you know, to, to, to reach his Nixon. So actually, it was he, 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 he held back a lot, whereas Michael Sheen comes in almost at pitch performance in rehearsal. It's a, and they, you know, and they're fantastic and Amazing. endless differences between the two of them. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and actually, the way that they approach their work is incredibly different. So Frank came and gave very little at first, and it didn't, really wasn't until he was out there doing Nixon that you could see you know, really, he held back quite a long way because he, he, you know, and he explained his process that he likes to sort of, he doesn't want to prejudge himself by arriving at something too quickly. Mm, interesting. Um, did you deliberately set out to make people like Susan feel sorry for Richard Nixon, or is that something that kind of develops in? With Frank Langella's performance as the play goes into no, I, I, I have uh, no, no, no. I have That's a lot in the script, Claire. Yeah, it yeah. is in the script. I think. I mean, I, I, you know, I have a lot of compassion for any human being that finds life difficult, <laughs> and uh, and he clearly found life very difficult. And his, you know, his inability to control his perspiration and and you know, the the notes he write. You know, I've seen now. You know, some of the notes he writes in the margins of books and and the memos he would write to himself and. And it is quite possible, if you, if you do the whole Red Riding Hood thing and say, right, today we're going to tell the story of Red Riding Hood, but from the point of view of a wolf, yeah. and you start with, I am hungry, mm -hmm. you know, you have compassion and understanding right. for, you know, for, for, for an otherwise monstrous character. And, and, and if you, you know, it, it, it's, I don't want to judge anybody in what I do. And uh, I, 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 t I, I took it as a, you know, as a sign that I'd probably done my job right by my own standards. The, the people from the Nixon Foundation and the Nixon Library really, really liked the character that well, I'd written. Well, you show him very self-effacing. Really? One on one, yes. I think it's. A, I mean, he he seemed to me oddly much warmer than David Frost, who was kind of always on and hustling and you know. Yeah, until then, the, then, the, then the Nixon, Nixon snaps. Was so self-deprecating when you have these personal conversations. How much of that dialogue did you create, and how much was from real? Between the stuff? two of them, yeah. Oh, there, that that was all yeah, no, created, all yeah, yeah. But because I mean, there was no, there's nothing on record. Well, uh, I wondered if Frost had said had said anything he had any of the comments he had had between him and Nixon. Oh, I see. Yeah. No, I, I don't think Did you think interview so. David? And, Although yeah. the, some, you know, one or two people who'd been present had, you know, so for example, in Frost's memoirs, yeah. one or two exchanges that they'd had, say, at San Clemente when they first went uh -huh. to sign the check. For example, that check yes. incident. The check yeah. incident. The check incident and the wonderful line, which again, you know, here I am, I will happily concede, it is not mine, <laughs> uh, about you should marry that woman. She comes from Monaco. They pay no taxes there. That really was a Dick Nixon line. And, and, you know, so of course... <laughs> what about the, the late night? <laughs> phone call. We should give set the scene here. Yes. There's a great S set the scene, and I still won't tell you if it's fact or fiction because and you can't. That's not like asking a magician to tell you that. Yeah, well, you can't do that. I mean, it, it, well, let me set the scene though. Of course. Nixon, who is charming and sympathetic throughout much of this play, okay. Then you come to a late night phone call where you see the Nixon that people who hated Nixon so much feared and despised. He calls David Frost, the, yeah. the, 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 the paranoid, the, the bitterness, the anger, all that ferocity that Richard Nixon was. And that's a brilliantly written scene, brilliantly played by Frank. That phone call to David Frost in the play, did it happen in real life? I can't answer that. Why? Be well, because, because whether it happened or didn't happen, within the context of the play, it's clearly had an... It's clearly worked for you in that sense. Absolutely. So, Absolutely, yeah. um, so uh, you know, for me to discuss what did or didn't actually happen and, and what people did or didn't tell me, I mean, why, does that enhance the experience that you've had? I mean, for me, what, what you see when you, when you, when you see it, I, I mean, I got... I, 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 it's just a compliment. A, you make it, whether or have not, it seems so real, we want to know. Very, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's more, it's more, if, it's sort of my sense of, of like a, a reader of history that I wonder, and it doesn't matter for my experience as a theater goer, what really happened and what didn't. I don't need to know, but that's why I ask, because I think, gee, did Nixon really say that? But did we, do, no, really no. Do, that? we do know, Peter, that he did not have necessarily this conversation with Frost. He did have these kind of conversations with 
people. People, with people. Yeah, absolutely. The truth is they didn't really have a conversation. And, and it was where, where I was interested in writing about their similarities, not their differences. Yeah. And, and, and the play had always, to me, been, you know, less a play, less an examination of Nixon and his politics. Um, it had always been a story where I, I would never have been drawn to write about Richard Nixon without the existence of David Frost. Mm. It is that particular cocktail that, yeah, that really gets me going. And, and this is one, you know, the truth is, you know, I'm inferring. When I look at the two of them and I think about them, I'm thinking, what must have been going on subconsciously? How, because when people sit opposite one another and they, you know, for weeks on end like this, well, they, you know, they develop, you know, prejudices or, or something beyond the questions, you know, and, and, and they would look at one another as two very different men. What would that, how would that, I don't know, what would the results of that be? And, and, and so this is, this is really me looking at those two men saying, this is what I make up about you two. Yeah. This is what I imagine exists there. And maybe you didn't find the way to say these words to one another, but I'm telling you, looking at you yeah. as a student, as it were, of humanity in that sense, this is, these are the connections I see between you two. And also you have on the record the actual interviews that show how Nixon was besting Frost, besting Frost, yes. and then how this amazing exchange flipped around. And that th there was like yes, a but that wasn't, yes, but I mean, I, you know, I, I can't unpick it all. Because, don't unpick it all. No. Thanks, please don't. No, because, no, no, because, no, 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 no. Because, you know, that I'm is sort of... I'm complimenting you in a moment. Well, it's quite straight, though. I mean, the interviews are used brilliantly here and very dynamically. Because I went back after I saw the play in London and looked at a lot of those Frost-Nixon interviews. And they're not all that compelling always. They're long stretches that aren't very interesting at all, you know. But you've sort of telescoped the, uh, the, the yeah. dramatic bits. So there. how long did you work on it? You went to Washington yeah, to research yeah. this, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I went to Washington. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, again, I'm not, I'm not a student of politics yeah. particularly. Uh, you know, politicians interest me, but I, you know, so I didn't know much about, uh, you know, the, the Washington political scene, and uh, I still, I'm a, a, a real rookie and, and don't know much. But, but I met people con connected with this, and they were all experienced journalists and uh, reporters and writers, and, and, uh, you know. The side that we haven't mentioned, actually, and it's appropriate that we're talking about it in here, is, is, is television as yeah. well. You know, the yeah. impact that television has on yeah. politics and, and the way in which television can reorder and recreate a kind of a, a fiction almost of something, you know, the way you recut it. Um, so I, I looked at these interviews and I thought, well, these are... I mean, Bob Woodward, for example, when I spoke to him, he said, what did, Nick, what did Frost get? He didn't get anything. Mm. And yet it had been sold as a big get. Yeah. And that really interested me too. Uh, you know, I, I'm sort of with Bob Woodward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have a look at Nixon's um, capitulation in context, he very quickly comes out of that vulnerability. Yeah. Yes. And he's very de quickly defiant again yes. and self justifying. Yeah. But you deliver. The eureka moment but here's the that's fabulous for the, the, your audience. Yeah, but here's well, but, it, but that's the story about television, and that, so my favourite speech actually, you know, is not the the, the uh, phone call, the nighttime phone call, which, you know, may be the most. I mean, that's the yeah. eleven o'clock number. Exactly, <laughs> the one that really means something to me is the one about television. It's the speech that the narrator gives about television, mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and, and and the close up and how it reduces, you know, yeah. the, the reductive nature of the close up and the crime of television in that sense, because they had that moment of Nixon. Yeah. Even though within the context of that interview, within seconds he was, he he was punching again, yeah. and, and 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 all that pain had vanished from his face, and he was like, no, but no, wait a minute. On the other hand, you know, um, because they had that, yeah. then they could print the still from that, and then they could trail that on the you know in the adverts for the show, and that becomes the meaning. And now Frost, in the, in, the, in the even further development of all this, Frost is now repackaged. <laughs> He's shameless, the man is... He is now repackaged. The whole interviews, they are no longer called the Nixon interviews. It's now called Frost Nixon. <laughs> Yeah, he's now taken the title of it. He's taken the poster from the play, and he's uh, and and he. It's called the Watergate interviews, and it's all about his crushing victory. And Amazing. Uh, and so he's really t he's literally <laughs> as though he'd listened to that speech about the reductive nature of the close-up. He's now just he's closed it right down to the entire enterprise being a tiny moment. Do you get royalties from the sale of these uh, Watergate tapes? Then? No. <laughs> no, no, no. God bless him. You've been asked this many times, but. What, 
what is your relationship with Queen Elizabeth at this point? Have you gotten feedback from her oh, indirectly I about your? About no, I haven't. I have no relationship with her. I mean, did, there was no feedback on your portrayal of her. No, I mean, there was a sort of um, there was an invitation to lunch which came from her private secretary, and that would have meant. I mean, she didn't invite us to lunch. Uh, he invited us to lunch, and that apparently that means that she then pops in for coffee. So did you go? We haven't gone yet because oh, none of us have been in the country at the same time. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, congratulations on all the success. The Queen, thank a you, wonderful thank you. movie. The Last King of Scotland, we didn't have a chance to talk about that, but um, you're hanging out with Idi Amin's family these days, do they? Of course. <laughs> right. And his 65 illegitimate children. But didn't you tell me, though, that um, you heard from someone in the family who liked the King of the Last King of Scotland? Didn't they think you portrayed Idi Amin well? So? I, 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 that, that hasn't reached me. No, sorry, <laughs> well, 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 have you been on those blogs It'll be again? Next week. <laughs> And we must not forget Frost Nixon, a great mesmerizing play by Peter Morgan at the, what theater are we at? Jacobs. The, at the Jacobs Theater, starring Frank Langella and Michael Sheen. Pleasure, Peter. Thanks for being our guest thanks, tonight. Thanks, Michael. thanks, Michael. Thanks, thanks for thanks taking the time. Thank you. So how do you think we should start? What should my first question be? Go for the throat.